Welcome to the Chapter 4 podcast on carbon and the molecular diversity of life. In this chapter, we're going to talk about why carbon is such a special molecule, what are its properties that really allow it to be the cornerstone of life. If you recall, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen make about up about 96% uh, of the molecules by molecular weight in an organism. About 96% of you is made up of these four atoms. So what is it about carbon that's so special? Why are we carbon-based life forms? And the answer really comes back down to structure and function. We're really looking at the configuration of its electrons and um, how bonding occurs. So organic chemistry Okay. Um, is not where we started. There was an originally biological thought. So first thing that we thought was vitalism. And vitalism really thought that there was an outside physical um, presence that dictated how things interacted. There was an outside kind of omnipotent presence that determined the physical and chemical laws. And this was really proposed and, and advocated for by Berzelius. After a while, we started looking at the natural world and our scientific methods became more pronounced. We became better students of observation and came to better conclusions and decided that all phenomena are really governed by physical and chemical laws. Okay? And that these laws are what dictates how things interact and how they behave. And this was really proposed by Miller. And he was an advocate of this. So what is it about carbon? What's really going on here? Well, carbon is the cornerstone of organic chemistry. Carbon, if you recall, has an atomic number of six, which means it has six protons, six electrons, and um, depending on its atomic mass, whether it's an isotope or not, about six neutrons. Now, these electrons are what we're most interested in and what are really going to dictate a lot of its properties here. If we have six electrons, recall that that means that we have four valence electrons. According to the octet rule, we want to have a total of eight valence electrons, so we need four more. Because of this, carbon tends to form four covalent bonds with a variety of other substances. It's what we call tetravalent. it's going to form four bonds. And because of that, it can form bonds in a variety of configurations. Um, when we're, if, whether we're forming double bonds or triple bonds or single bonds, we're really able to add on a lot of different atoms to that central carbon skeleton. And it's that central carbon skeleton that most biomolecules are made up of. When we say biomolecules, we're talking about things like carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. You can see here the, the other four biggies. Um, hydrogen has a valence electron of one, so it's only able to form one other bond. Hydrogen is also pretty electropositive, so it's as likely to share as it is to give up its electron. Oxygen is kind of a bully on the block, very electronegative, and needs to form two more bonds. Oxygen, when it bonds with hydrogen, tends to form a polar covalent bond, which is that unequal distribution of electrons. Nitrogen as well. Nitrogen needs three more um, electrons to form that full octet. It has five in its valence shell, and carbon has four. So continuing on our conversation here about hydrocarbons, um, a hydrocarbon, just like its name, in organic chemistry, names are a beautiful thing because we name things according to exactly what kind of molecules they have in them, what kinds of atoms they have in them, and the type of bonds. So it really gives us a description of how the molecule is constructed. So a hydrocarbon is any molecule that's composed purely of hydrogen and carbon. So only hydrogen and carbon. Okay. And these are things that you encounter every day, things like uh, petroleum, okay, our fuel, is a hydrocarbon, as well as the fatty acid tails, the lipid tails, in a lot of the fats we're going to talk about. And hydrocarbons are really good for energy storage. They store a lot of energy in those carbon-hydrogen bonds. 
the type of bond we're forming between carbon and hydrogen, because their electronegativities are pretty close, is a nonpolar covalent bond. And this is important for a couple of reasons. A nonpolar covalent bond. This is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you recall, a nonpolar covalent bond, the electrons are shared equally. So there's no partial charge on the molecule. Because of that, it means that this molecule is effectively neutral and that it's insoluble in water, which explains why oil and water don't mix. Okay, oil is composed of these hydrocarbon chains and they're nonpolar, so because of that, the oil has no attraction for the water and vice versa, so they don't mix together. Now, there's a few different ways that these hydrocarbons can be put together. We can have the same chemical formula, but put the molecules together in very different ways because those carbons can bond with four different atoms and in a variety of configurations. We can have double bonds, we can have single bonds, we can even have triple bonds in there, and we can bond at different angles depending on the number of other atoms that that carbon molecule is bonding with. So hydrocarbons can have three kind of basic structures. Hydrocarbons may be branched, they may form chains, and hydrocarbons can also form ring structures. Okay. Glucose is a great example. Glucose um, forms a chain, but when it's put into solution, put into water, the glucose molecule actually curves around on itself and forms a ring structure. So you'll see those both ways when we get to chapter five. Now, the same chemical formula, the same molecule can be put together in any one of these ways, and we call that an isomer. So an isomer, or isomers of each other, have the same chemical formula, but they have different arrangements of the atoms, different structures, different arrangement of the atoms involved. So if we draw our attention over here, you can see a very simple hydrocarbon chain. This one happens to be C5H12 and goes by the name of pentene. Okay, Pent because it has five carbons. Both of these molecules here are pentane, C5H12. But you can see that this one, each carbon forms a linear chain. Whereas in here, off of carbon number two, if we name the carbons one, two, three, four, off of number, carbon number two, the fifth carbon is attached. So it has a different structure. These are called structural isomers. The second type of isomers we see here, these cis-trans isomers, these are geometric isomers. Okay, and geometric isomers are so named because there's some kind of rotation in where the atoms are located. So you can see that in this diagram, attached to these central carbons, we have this X and we have the H, the hydrogen atom, and on the other carbon we have the X and the H, and the X's are on the same sides. One is attached to carbon number one, one is attached to carbon number two. If we look at the trans isomer, we still have an X attached to carbon number one and an X attached to carbon number two, but now there's been a rotation so that those X's, those atoms of interest, are on opposite sides of each other. Those are known as geometric isomers. And the last type of isomer listed here are enantiomers. Enantiomers are mirror images of each other, like your hands are mirror images of one another. Okay? So the same basic structure, but they're mirror images. And enantiomers have huge implications in pharmaceuticals, so huge implications in medicine. Let me show you a couple examples of those. Okay, So for example, here are two different enantiomers. And one of the enantiomers, structure and function, remember, is effective and one is ineffective. So here's one for ibuprofen. There are two different enantiomers, the S-ibuprofen and the R-ibuprofen. They are composed of the same atoms, same chemical formula, but they're mirror images of one another. Same thing with albuterol, okay, which is a treatment for asthma. 
one of the albuterol isomers, one of the enantiomers is effective, while the other one is not. You can imagine how important this is for the pharmaceutical industry. If you're going to create a drug, number one, you want to make sure that it's effective. Number two, you want to make sure that you have the right composition of that drug in whatever the delivery system is. So in the inhaler or in the capsule, you want to make sure that you have the right enantiomer. Otherwise, it's effectively not going to do anything. Here's a good question for you, though. Why would one of these be effective and not the other? If you think back to what you know about chemistry and what you know about structure and function of molecules, you know that in order for a drug to interact with your system, whether it's artificial or whether it's a hormone, okay, either of those things, natural hormones, okay, drugs, anything that wants to elicit a response in your system has to interact with receptor proteins on the surface of your cells. Now some molecules interact inside the cell, but on the surface of your cell, to keep things simple, there's a variety of different protein molecules that act um, as receptors. And in order for this molecule to have an effect, it has to bind with that protein receptor, and then it causes some kind of chain reaction in the cell and elicits a response. These receptors, and if we remember what we know about proteins, proteins have a very unique three-dimensional shape. So that unique three-dimensional shape is only going to interact with molecules that have the right configuration of atoms to fit into that 3D shape. So one of the, these enantiomers, these S enantiomers in this case, and the R enantiomer in the case of albuterol, fit within those protein receptors. The other enantiomer doesn't interact in the same way, so it doesn't elicit the same kind of response that's necessary.